promised that I was going to be doing collected stories from Gabi Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Now, I selected that before I had read most of his works. And unfortunately, they're a little sad and on the death end of things. And as a result, I decided I'd fulfill what I promised and give you one of his stories and then go over to something else, which I'll tell you about when we get there. But these stories really are quite effective. It's just, I need things a little happier these days. And the, uh, this collection of stories, um, which is uh, right here, Collected Stories is the title, is in stock at Story and Song, and it is really quite worth reading. Um, it's just be sure you're in a good mood when you do it. Uh, there are three books that are uh, accessed, collections of short stories, and he really was quite, quite well known. This is from Big Mama's Funeral, and it was translated from the Spanish by J.S. Bernstein. And by the way, always be careful that you're aware of who's translating a foreign work because their skill as a translator uh, can reflect on just the way you approach uh, a story. All translators are not created equal. This one is short. It is called One of These Days. Monday dawned warm and rainless. Aurelio Escobar, a, a dentist without a degree and a very early riser, opened his office at six. He took out some false teeth, still mounted in their plaster mold, out of the glass case and put on the table a fistful of instruments which he arranged in size order as if they were on display. He wore a collarless striped shirt, closed at the neck, with a, a golden stud and pants held up by suspenders. He was erect and skinny, with a look that rarely corresponded to the situation. You know, the, the way deaf people have of looking. When he had things arranged on the table, he pulled the drill toward the dental chair and sat down to polish the false teeth. He seemed not to be thinking about what he was doing, but worked steadily, pumping the drill with his feet, even when he didn't need it. After eight, he stopped for a while to look at the sky through the window and he saw two pensive buzzards who were drying themselves in the uh, sun on the ridge pole of the house next door. He went on working with the idea that before lunch it would rain again. The shrill voice of his 11-year-old son interrupted his concentration. Papa! What? The mayor wants to know if, you, if you'll pull his tooth. Tell him, I'm not here. He was polishing a gold tooth. He held it at arm's length and examined it with his eyes half closed. His son shouted again from the little waiting room. He says you are too because he can hear you. The dentist kept examining the tooth. Only when he had put it on the table with the finished work did he say, so much the better. He operated the drill again. He took several pieces of a bridge out of a cardboard box where he kept things he still had to do and began to polish the gold. Papa! What? He still hadn't changed his expression. He says, if you don't take out his tooth, he'll shoot you. Without hurrying, 
with an extremely a tranquil movement. He stopped peddling the drill, pushed it away from the chair and pulled the lower drawer of the table all the way out. There was a revolver. Okay, tell him to come and shoot me. He rolled the chair over opposite the door, his hand resting on the edge of the drawer. The mayor appeared at the door. He had shaved the left side of his face, but the other side, swollen and in pain, had a five-day-old beard. The dentist saw many nights of desperation in his dull eyes. He closed the drawer with his fingertips and said softly, Sit down. A good morning, said the mayor. Morning, said the dentist. While the instruments were boiling, the mayor leaned his skull on the headrest of the chair and felt better. His breath was icy. It was a poor office. You know, an old wooden chair, the, the pedal drill, a, a glass case with ceramic bottles. Opposite the chair was a window with a shoulder-high cloth curtain. When he felt the dentist approach, the mayor braced his heels and opened his mouth. Aurelio Escobar turned his head toward the light. After inspecting the infected tooth, he closed the mayor's jaw with a cautious pressure of his fingers. It has to be without anesthesia, he said. Why? Because you have an abscess. The mayor looked him in the eye. <sighs> All right he said, and tried to smile. The dentist did not return the smile. He brought the basin of sterilized instruments to the work table and took them out of the water with a, a pair of cold tweezers, still without hurrying. Then he pushed the spittoon with the tip of his shoe and went to wash his hands in the wash basin. He did all this without looking at the mayor. But the mayor didn't take his eyes off him. It was a lower wisdom tooth. The dentist spread his feet and grasped the tooth within the hot forceps. The mayor seized the arms of the chair, braced his feet with all his strength, and felt an icy void in his pink kidneys but didn't make a sound. The dentist moved only his wrist. Without rancor, rather with a, a bitter tenderness, he said, now you'll pay for our 20 dead men. The mayor felt the crunch of bones in his jaw and his eyes filled with tears, but he didn't breathe until he felt the tooth come out. Then he saw it through his tears. It seemed so foreign to his pain that he failed to understand his torture of the five previous nights. Bent over the spittoon, sweating, panting, he unbuttoned his tunic and reached for the handkerchief in his pants pocket. The dentist gave him a clean Dry your tears, he said. <laughs> the mayor did. He, he was, was trembling. While the dentist washed his hands, he saw the crumbling ceiling in a dusty spider web with spiders, eggs, and dead insects. The dentist returned, drying his hands. Go to bed, he said, and gargle with salt water. The mayor stood up, said goodbye with a casual military salute, and walked toward the door, stretching his legs 
without buttoning up his tunic. Send the bill, he said, to you or the town. The mayor didn't look at him. He closed the door and said through the screen, it's the same damn thing. That was written in 1962. Uh, and I may or may not have mentioned, but um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez is the winner of the Nobel Prize. Really quite a, an exciting book. Now, to fill in, I'm going back to an old favorite, The Art of X-Ray Reading by Roy Peter Clark. Now, this is the uh, one we read in context with The Great Gatsby. Now, today we're going to explore different authors, Hemingway and Joan Didion. This section is called Words Left Out. Writers of my generation, the baby boomers, grew up being told that Ernest Hemingway was a great writer. We read his books, such as uh, The Old Man and the Sea, as early as junior high. And our first inklings of authorial style came from the legendary writer's pellucid prose. There was also a uh, macho bravado surrounding Hemingway a personal narrative of great adventures around the world that lent his work an additional muscularity. A typical tribute came from the author Ford Mannix Ford, who in 1932 introduction to an edition of Hemingway's novel, A Farewell uh, to Arms, wrote, and I quote, Hemingway's words strike you each one as if they were pebbles fetched from a brook. And they live and shine, each in its place. So one of his pages has the effect of a brook bottom into which you look down through the flowing water. The words form a tessellation, each in order, beside the other. It is a very great now, I'm coming back to Roy Clark. The word tessellation means mosaic, and it is the kind of word, like my pellucid, that Hemingway might not have used when a more common one was available. In the harsh light of such glowing tributes, it became our job to kneel at the altar of Papa Hemingway and to worship such passages as this famous one, which opens a farewell to arms, a novel set in Italy during World War I. And here I quote Hemingway in a farewell to arms. In the late summer of that year, we lived in a house in a village that looked across the river and the plain to the mountains. In the bed of the river, there were pebbles and boulders, dry and white in the sun. And the water was clear and swiftly moving and blue in the channel. Troops went by the house and down the road and the dust they raised powdered the leaves of the trees. The trunks of the trees too were dusty and the leaves fell early that year. And we saw the troops marching along the road and the dust rising and leaves stirred by the breeze falling and the soldiers marching and afterwards the road bare and white, except for the leaves. And now back to the text 
Dr. Roy Clark. I can now say that as a young reader and writer, I did not get Hemingway at all. My negativity may have been nothing more than a 1960s rebellion against the sensibilities of our parents. Oh, I could see why Shakespeare was great. Oh, and, and Chaucer, too. But Hemingway was the same age as our parents. And if they liked him, it was evidence that something was wrong. I liked Little Richard, not Patty Page. While some would claim that the passage above is strong, clear, lean, direct, and pure, all I could see was dry, repetitious, undecorated, and dull. A movie star without makeup. My problem, of course, was that I did not yet own a pair of uh, X ray glasses. I wasn't reading close enough. A subtitle What's There and What's Missing? To my rescue came another great American writer, Joan Didion, an important literary stylist in her own right, who had mastered uh, forms as diverse as novel, memoir, essay, and screenplay. When an unfinished novel of Hemingway's came out in 1998, Didion wrote about it in the New Yorker magazine. Ah, it was a dazzling essay that began with the excerpt from Hemingway, quoted previously, what follows is her remarkable X-ray reading of the text. Oh, no, not, not from the perspective of a critic or scholar, but that of a fellow writer. She is clearly looking deep beneath the surface of the text, and she does it in a single, long paragraph. And here I quote Joan Didion. That paragraph was published in 1929, bears examination. Four deceptively simple sentences, 126 words, the arrangement of which remains as mysterious and thrilling to me now as it did when I first read them. 12 or 13, and imagine that if I studied them closely enough and practiced hard enough, I might one day arrange 126 such words myself. Only one of the words had three syllables. 22 have two. The other 103 have one. 24 of the words are the. 15 are and. There are four commas. The liturgical cadence of the paragraph derives in part from the placement of the commas, their presence in the second and fourth sentences, their absence in the first and third but also from the repetition of the and of and, creating a rhythm so pronounced that the omission of the before the word leaves in the fourth sentence, and this is it, and we saw the troops marching along the road and the dust rising in the leaves stirred by the breeze falling, casts exactly what it was meant to cast. A chill, a premonition, a foreshadowing of the story to come, the awareness that the author has already shifted his attention from late summer to a darker season. The power of the paragraph, offering as it does the illusion but not the fact 
of specificity, derives precisely from this kind of deliberate omission, from the tension of withheld information. In the late summer of what year? What river? What mountain? What troops? And I return to Roy Clark. That analysis turns out to be one of the best X-ray readings I have ever encountered. So granular that I am now fixated on the ands and thes. So persuasive that I am reading Hemingway with fresh eyes. Cheers, Papa, because of Miss Didion, you made it into this book. To strain yourself looking for cinnamon synonyms for river, house, road, leaves, and dust. These words are form the foundation for the passage and the repetition falls on the reader like a drumbeat. River and house are repeated twice. More important words, road and dust, occur three times. And perhaps the most important noun, leaves, rings four times. One solid variation is when troops mentioned twice become soldiers by the end as if an indistinguishable group becomes individualized as it approaches and passes. Another form of variation allows key words to come together uh, towards some parallel structure as in these phrases in the final sentence. Troops marching, dust rising, leaves falling, soldiers marching. The simplicity of the words <clears throat> finds a counterpoint in the length of the sentences. They run from 26 words to 30 to 20 to 50. The length of that final sentence mimics the marching of the troops, which is an excellent match of form to function. <clears throat> the short sentence may sound like the gospel truth. The long sentence takes us on a journey. Two qualities stand out about the diction or, or word choice in this passage. One of them, as Didion points out, is brevity. Most of the words consist of a single syllable. Something that's easier to find in English, say, uh, than, say, in Italian, because our language draws from Anglo-Saxon or Old English with its many single beat words. After 1066, that language would be invaded by Norman French, adding a rich inventory of polysyllables and Latinate abstractions to the mix. So that by the time of Chaucer writing in 1380, he had a treasure chest at his fingertips. Hemingway seems to prefer Anglo-Saxon in his choice of words, such as house, dry, dust, white, trees, road, breeze, and leaves. I checked, and all these are derived from Old English except breeze, which may derive from the Spanish gris, short words that can find their way into English by various paths. In addition to their brevity, the words in this passage are marked by their plainness and commonness. In spite of the sophistication of Hemingway's novel in terms of theme and characterization, there is no word in the passage that would not be recognized by an average elementary school student. Perhaps the most literary word is the descriptive metaphor powdered, which is a substitute for, say, uh, dusted. 
If I had to choose the most important word, well, the obvious answer would be leaves because of its emphasis, repetition, and thematic foreshadowing. A subtler answer would be afterwards, as, as an adverb, often characterized as a weak part of speech. This may seem a surprising candidate, except for this. It is the only three-syllable word in the passage, and as such, stands out from the rest. In the land of the monosyllable, the uh, trisyllable modifier gains a certain stature. More important is its meaning. Afterward, signifies the state of the world subsequent to the movement of the piece, leaving only the symbols of death in their powdery wakes. This landscape at the front door of the novel bears a bitter fruit at its end when the protagonist will lose a stillborn child and then its mother. Very big things like the death of humans in a big war can be prefigured by little things like dusty leaves upon the ground, love, sexual union, and the creation of new life could have been an antidote to the pervasive poison of war. Oh, but not in Hemingway's view of the world. As I was writing this chapter, the American Scholar magazine ran a, a brief feature called 10 Best Sentences Selected by Their Editors. I noticed that one of the sentences was written by Joan Didion. It appeared in her book, Slouching Toward Bethlehem. And here I quote that sentence. It was the United States of America in the cold late spring of 1967, and the market was steady, and the GNP high, and a great many articulate people seemed to have a sense of high social purpose. And it might have been a spring of brave hopes and national promise but it was not. And more and more people had the uneasy apprehension that it was not. Perhaps I was drunk on Hemingway at the time, but I see in Didion's 67-word sentence a familiar pattern. The passage is more abstract than Hemingway's. There are no roads, rivers, houses, trees, or leaves covered with dust. No, there is not much to see. But most of the words are short and simple. The is repeated four times, as is an, which acts like a coupling link between rail cars, just as there is a tension in Hemingway between the natural order and the machinery of war, there is in Didion a kind of nihilism in the repetition of it was not, and in the negation of brave hopes and high social purpose. I can well imagine Didion reading the passage from Hemingway and then writing his own. Clark closes with uh, writing lessons which really can be reinterpreted as readers, reading writers, suggestions. One, as important as it was to put in uh, is what was to leave out. This is easy to say, but hard to do. After you've written a draft, read it aloud, but only to yourself. If you read it to someone else, that person may ask questions, which will lead to a longer draft. 
that can make things clearer. But if your goal is spare prose, it helps to listen for the useless or distracting word or phrase. Oh, it may look right on the page, but when you, you hear it, it may sound like that extra note in the trumpet solo. Two, repetition is different from redundancy. Oh, don't strain yourself looking for synonyms. I'll point this lesson out several times in this book. Think of repetition as a drum beat. Somehow a marching drummer can repeat a rhythm countless times without making it sound tedious. After a while, the rhythm becomes unnoticeable, almost like a heartbeat. But it must be done for effect and with a purpose. Beware of those times when you unintentionally repeat a word or image. Readers will judge you as being inattentive. The big words count, point three. But so do the little ones. I'll demonstrate this by revising my last sentence. Big words count, but so do little ones. Huh. I like that better, I think. It feels plainer somehow and more direct. Yet the definite article, the, expands the effect of the words it modifies. Perhaps by emphasizing the parallel distinction between the big words and the little ones. Four, and finally, Hemingway's dusty landscape should remind us that a setting can be symbolic. In the summer of 2014, I began to notice how many news stories involved violence or attempted violence in elevators. I, I realized that an elevator, even with its compression of time and space, is an effective setting for certain kinds of stories. It is a box of fears, of height, of enclosed spaces, of crowds. It reminds me how often authors choose certain kinds of spaces. The garden, the dungeon, the tower chamber, the cave pressurize human action. These enclosed spaces are often balanced against much broader symbolic landscapes, such as oceans, mountains, deserts, or swamps. As I think of the series Breaking Bad, I remember the tension created when the protagonists, Walter and Jesse, built a meth lab in the confines of a trailer, then drove it out for privacy and security into the barrenness of the desert. Some further bits and pieces on the roadmap to becoming a perfect X-ray reader. I hope you enjoyed uh, today's substitution, or I should say addition, now I want to give you a heads up. Wednesday is Poetry Day, and we're sticking to that. But this next Wednesday, oh, it's a special Wednesday. Please come at 3 o'clock and join Nola Perez in her the opening of her most recent, last ever, book of poetry. She and I will be speaking about the book and will share it with you. Until Wednesday, have a very marvelous weekend. Thank you for visiting with us.